Hey, welcome back to the channel. Welcome if you're new. It's your boy Nick here. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. God, I miss you guys. I hope you all miss me as much as I miss you. It's gonna be a good day, a good episode. Keep cruising down the Team Outlooks videos. All 32 teams we're getting to, which means every single player, fantasy outlooks. We're wrapping up the NFC West today with the San Francisco 40. Niners. If you guys have been enjoying these team outlooks, please let me know in the comment section and give this video a thumbs up to let me know to keep doing all these, you know? I'm trying to get out as much content as possible, sleepers, busts, mock crafts, all that kind of stuff, but I want to get every single team out there so you have an idea of my thoughts on every single player going into the season, right? But enough of that, let's get to the video. So without a doubt, the biggest move in San Francisco this offseason wasn't even a player. It was taking Kyle Shanahan, RIP, from my Atlanta Falcons and hiring him as their head coach, looking to switch things up, looking to head in a new direction. The team as a whole, their offense is pretty much without direction, right? They signed Brian Hoyer this offseason as well as Matt Barkley. Hoyer's basically already been anointed the starter there. Not a great quarterback, not a great real life quarterback or fantasy quarterback, obviously, but he's tasted glimpses of success throughout his career in fantasy, something Matt Barkley really hasn't. When you look back at last year, very small sample size, but from week three to week six, four game span, Hoyer threw for over 300 passing yards in all four games, a 6-0 to zero touchdown interception ratio, and completed 72% of his passes. Most importantly, he was a top five fantasy quarterback in that span. Now it's with the Bears. It's a, a decent argument that the Bears offense is not much better than this Niners offense. Either way, I'm not touching Hoyer with a 49-foot pole in fantasy. Very deep quarterback, probably outside of my top 24 rankings. Whatever, whatever. And when we look at his weapons, I like this section because I have like nothing to talk about. There is one guy that really, really, very much intrigues me this year, and that's Pierre Garçon. Pierre Garçon moves over from Washington, from the East Coast to the West Coast, signs with the Niners, coming off a really good, quiet, big season. Caught almost 80 balls, and he went for 1,041 yards, so he hit that 1,000 receiving mark. The big takeaway here is that he's reuniting with Kyle Shanahan. He played with Kyle Shanahan in Washington back in 2013, and he operated as that X receiver for him. Now, listen to his numbers when he was playing with Shanahan. He led the NFL with 113 receptions. This is Pierre Garçon. He had 1,346 yards. Only scored five times, but 113 for 1,346. That's huge PPR numbers. That X position, that X receiver in a Shanahan offense, always produces. Realistically, on this offense, Garcon's the only like proven weapon. And we've seen Hoyer, you know, pick his receivers, pick guys, pinpoints them, and feeds them, you know, 10 to 15 targets a game. We've seen this throughout his career. And Garcon's been creeping up draft boards a little bit with all this hype around him and the whole Shanahan storyline. Right now, he's 69 overall, pick 69 overall, right behind Martavis Bryant, Brandon Marshall, Kelvin Benjamin, Pierre Garcon as wide receiver 33. Then you got Jameson Crowder, Dante Moncrief behind him. I think that's just about right. His floor is really high. Like I said, he's the only receiver there. He should see 110, 120 targets in that offense, which should be really, really good PPR numbers. He's one of my favorite sleepers going into 2017. Not a, not a high touchdown upside, obviously, but the PPR numbers should be there. And the next up on the, on the depth chart, I guess you could say, is Jeremy Curley running out of the slot. They re-signed him to a three-year, about $10.5 million contract this offseason. He actually led the team in catches with 64 and receiving yards with 667 in 20. 2016, I think Garcon is going to eat up a chunk of those targets over the middle, and I think Curley's going to dip pretty low considering how Kyle Shanahan's offense runs. They do a lot of play action, and they don't funnel the ball into the slot. I mean, think of think about the Falcons last year. They run the ball a ton, a lot of screen passes to the running backs. They use Julio on the outside. They use Muhammad Tanu a lot. They didn't they barely ever use a lot, utilize the slot game. Curly's number, I think, takes a big hit. Curly's not even fantasy relevant, but other than those two guys, well, so they signed Aldrick Robinson from the Falcons, which is interesting because Kyle Shanahan obviously was with the Falcons last year, and maybe he sees something in Aldrick Robinson as a deep threat. That's what he was for the Falcons. Nothing there. Wouldn't take him. And then you have Bruce Bruce Ellington got a lot of hype coming into last year. It was supposed to be the slot guy. Jeremy Curley's that guy now, so Bruce Ellington's off the radar as well. They they got they made a couple other moves in, in the draft and through free agency, but no one that's fantasy relevant. So we'll just keep on cruising through the tight ends. Which brings me to Vance McDonald, who I'm, I'm pretty pissed about how this worked out. I really liked him as a late-round tight end sleeper. He would have been one of my top late-round picks. Going to this year, had you know, had the offseason not happened, John Lynch immediately halted that hype train. 
It was like a day after Vance McDonald signed a big contract extension last year. He blew out his knee, missed the rest of the season. Now with John Lynch here, they're rehauling everything. The new regime is not a fan of McDonald. John Lynch came out, right, and said that they were shopping him during the NFL draft. He's only 26. He's a good receiver. I don't really see what the problem is here. I guess it doesn't fit in Shanahan's uh, scheme. But Lynch backed up his words. They picked another tight end in the draft. A guy named George Kittle with the 146th pick out of Iowa. Big guy, 6'4", 247. Runs a 4'5", 240. That is, if you're unaware, that's really fast for a tight end. So he's a really good athlete. Just one of those guys that fits the, the mold of a good athlete, good tight end, catches the ball, can run well, good size. The physical biography is there. And reportedly, he's been getting a lot of the first team work at OTAs and gaining pretty good rapport with uh, Brian Hoyer. So it looks like Vance McDonald's out of the picture. It looks like George Kittle kind of puts himself on the map to, you know, in that late tight end two discussion as a, as a possible sleeper, given that there's no real weapons there. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of upside here, though just as the offense struggles as a whole. So George Kittle, someone to keep an eye on in Dynasty, Keeper League, something like that. So one of the more tricky, I guess, uh, situations in the running back sphere for fantasy purposes is the Niners backfield. Obviously we got Carlos Hyde, who I'm a big fan of. They're, the new regime is not. John Lynch, he ain't about that life. Big problem here is Hyde's health, obviously. When he's on the field, he's been excellent. He dealt with injuries his rookie season, and he missed almost 40% of the team's games over the last two seasons. Can't stay on the field. But look at what he did last year in, in the 13 games that he did play in, right? He went over 1,100 total yards. He scored nine touchdowns, and he was able to run for 4.6 yards per carry behind Football Outsiders' worst-ranked offensive line. Worst-ranked rush blocking line. Like, that's really fucking efficient and productive given what he has there to work with. So I want to read off a couple other stats from Pro Football Focus. They got pretty in-depth. So Hyde is ranked inside the top 10 for yards after contact each of the last two seasons among running backs with minimum 100 rushes. And he was he was sixth in 2016 last year. He's also been top 10 over that time span for tackles eluded per attempt. So he's not just powerful, he's super elusive too. He is the total package in my opinion. And I'm loving how this offseason, how the reports are coming out this offseason because he's just getting pushed down the board more and more. This ADP right now, he's running back 17 off the board at pick 49. In a 10 team league, that's almost the sixth round. Just crazy to me. The Niners are concerned he's not gonna fit Kyle Shanahan's sheen that well, but I'm not really concerned because I think his skill set would fit any, any offense. He's just 25 years old. He's got that clear-cut RB1 upside. On a points per game basis, fancy points per game, he was top 10. He was the top 10 running back last year. So I get the concerns. I really do. But where he's being priced, the upside is so high. doesn't make sense not to at least consider taking him in the fourth or fifth round. And I feel like by the time drafts come around, he'll probably be going within the 30 to 35 range. But that's not where, you know, that's not where this storyline ends. They added a few backs this offseason. They cut Dewan Harris, who was pretty effective for them last year, but they signed former Saints running back Tim Hightower, who had a really good year with them last year with the Saints in 2016. And uh, it's, it's definitely more of a depth thing for Hyde in case he gets hurt. But the interesting storyline here is the rookie running back that they drafted, Joe Williams out of Utah. This is one of the more intriguing storylines of the entire offseason, let alone the NFL draft. So listen to this kid's history, right? He's 24 right now. He's going to be a rookie. GM John Lynch completely took him off the draft board. This guy, Joe Williams. His freshman year at UConn, he was expelled for theft. Then he spent two years at ASA College in Brooklyn, sophomore, junior year, and he eventually transferred to Utah and played his last year at Utah, but he retired from football that season in, in September. He said he didn't want to play anymore, came back to the team a month later. So this kid's all over the place. Mentality, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what went through his head, but the new head coach, Kyle Shanahan, loved him. Thought he would be the tremendous fit. A lot of reports are saying that he sees him as the new uh, Tevin Coleman in this offense. So Shanahan was able to convince Lynch to put him back on the board, then trade up for him in the fourth round. They took him in the fourth round, pick 121 overall. Crazy story there. The kid's 5'10", 5'11", about 210 pounds, so a good size. Runs a 4'4", 140, so really good breakaway speed, just like Tevin Coleman. He actually had the second best weight adjusted speed score in the combine among all running backs behind only Leonard Fournette. So he does have a very similar playing style to Coleman. But what kind of worries me is he's had fumbling issues throughout college. He also dropped five of his total 27 targets in college. 
not a great pass catcher, something that was a huge part of Tevin Coleman's game. So there have been a ton of articles. A lot of people love Joe Williams. There was like a report that they, that some beat writers said they wouldn't be surprised if Joe Williams started the season over Carlos Hyde. I think that's fucking ridiculous. I think Joe Williams is a product of, you know, nowadays there's there's articles about every single rookie running back in the draft and, and about how they're going to be the starter on their respective team. So I think Joe Williams is a product of just too much rookie running back hype and too much buzz. I do think, you know, it's it's definitely possible that the fact that Kyle Shanahan loves him this much, he gets playtime early. It's definitely still Carlos Hyde's backfield to lose, though. There was another report that just came out. This guy, Matt Breida, B-R-E-I-D-A. Uh, he's an undrafted free agent. And uh, supposedly, he's been making a lot of noise in camp and has looked better than Williams. So, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's definitely a backfield up for grabs. I think Hyde, for me, is definitely that guy. If he's going to be going anywhere past pick 35, I think he's a great value. Um, obviously, the scoring upside is not really there, but it's even hard to say that considering he scored nine touchdowns in 13 games, right? So if, if he could be that featured back, if he could stay healthy, he's definitely a risk-reward pick. Um, but if you you know if if you grab two players who have been two or three players that are that are very risk averse in the first few rounds and and you're looking for you know you go three wide receivers and you're looking for a high upside running back Carlos Hyde could definitely be that guy for you so I'm on him I really like Hyde again this year and uh, I'm not going to reach for him given the risk but if he drops to a good value I'll be all over that I like to add in a little question at the end to get the engagement get some comments flowing so if you had to pick one running back straight up half point PPR do you want Carlos Hyde, CJ Anderson, or or Eddie Lacy? How's that one for you? Get to pick one of them straight up. No ADP, no value. Just want to know what your thoughts are. I'd go Hyde, probably Lacy, and then Anderson. Now to wrap up the vid. Hope you all enjoyed. If you did, make sure you give it that thumbs up. As always, follow me on Twitter. Subscribe to the blog. And uh, subscribe to the channel, obviously, if you're new. And we'll be coming at you all off-season, throughout the season as well. I'll see you all homies next time.